So what's your first impression when you hear archaeology? To many, it could be dry, boring, lots of hot, dusty work, finding mummies or vast fortunes hidden away for centuries. And to others, it could be excitement, intrigue, adventure, Indiana Jones style. Well, today, we're going to explore something that combines many different things, solving mysteries and proving answers to age-old questions in relation to the Bible. We're going to look at biblical archaeology, and in our talk this afternoon, we can only cover a portion of the vast amount of information that's available. And since the early to mid-1800s until now, more and more discoveries are being made to support and prove the credibility of the Bible. Evidence is being brought to light to show the accuracy of the Bible even as we speak, another discovery is probably being made. Archaeology is a science that uncovers and explains the past evidence of man's civilization. Webster's Dictionary defines archaeology as the systematic study of our past human life and culture by the recovery and examination of remaining material evidence. It's a science because there are scientific procedures that must be followed. It's not a treasure hunt where digging is conducted in a haphazard manner, and this how, is how much of history has been lost due to scavenging. Archaeology gradually uncovers meaning that digging takes place layer by layer. It's just like anything else. To get to the truth of something, you have to get it layer by layer. But uncovering is not enough. It must also be studied and explained. And archaeology can take place anywhere in the world where civilizations once existed. What is unique about biblical archaeology is that it looks at the past biblical evidence of man's civilization. It's confined to biblical places, biblical peoples, and times. There are nine different present-day countries involved when looking at biblical archaeology. You have Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, Italy, Iraq, and Iran. And as we know, several of these countries listed are dangerous and not very hospitable. There is frequent fighting, and in most of these countries, foreigners are not welcome, making it de very difficult to conduct archaeological expeditions. The Israelis are doing much in Israel, and in 1967, when Israel recovered the West Bank, they began to reconstruct their past through archaeological expeditions. And Moshe Dayan, I don't know if many people remember him, that was the guy that had the patch, uh, he was their minister of defense, and he was also an avid archaeologist. The Bible mentions many different peoples, such as the Romans, the Greeks, Galatians, Cretans, the Jews, Samaritans, and the Philistines, the Hittites, and the Egyptians. In studying biblical peoples, the goal is to discover any evidence of these civilizations. The period of time for the Old Testament starts with creation, of course, in Genesis 1 and 1, and runs through the return from exile in Babylon. Now, as everyone is sitting there wondering what that thing is up on the screen, um, the Sumerian, Sumerian king list, one of the history's first mentions of a great flood, and this is on the uh, Gilgamesh epic, and that's what that stone is right there. It was the Sumerians established the first civilization in the biblical world, and several clay tablets and prisms containing the list of their kings have been found in the ruins of Mesopotamia. Surviving copies of the Sumerian king list date to 2100 BC. What's striking about the list of Sumerian kings is that the kings are divided into two groups, those who ruled before a great flood and those who ruled after it. Equally striking is that the lengths of reigns, especially light, the lifespans of these kings, drastically decreased after the flood, as did the spans of people recorded in the Bible. The king list says, after the flood had swept over the earth, and when kingship was toward, lowered again from heaven, 
Mention of a flood hardly necessary in the list of kings as an argument for the biblical flood described in Genesis 7 and 8. So accounts of a massive flood are found in many cultures around the world, and this Gilgamesh epic, the saga of an ancient Babylonian king, Gilgamesh, includes an expanded flood story on this tablet, similar to the flood story in Genesis 6 through 9. The best known copy of the epic was found at Nineveh on a series of baked clay tablets. Tablet 11, which is what you see there, of the Gilgamesh epic tells of a great flood brought on earth by the wrath of gods and includes a hero who is told to build a ship. This is their story now. To take every kind of animal along and to use birds to check to see if the water had receded. Copies of the epic and other flood stories have been found in the Near East, and the popularity of the flood theme argues for its historicity and supports the flood of Noah's theme. So it's quite interesting. And archaeology helps to illuminate the people and places in the Bible by providing background information and shedding light on what the world was like during the time of the Old Testament. The Bible is not a full and complete record, so the customs, clothing, religion, and travel for some of the people in the Bible are sometimes not known or fully understood. And archaeology provides information about the customs of the people, their clothing, material objects, economy. And it uncovers information about their trade routes, types of travel, occupations, housing, government, and religion. These are all things that you might know about or see in the Bible but not really fully understand. And all of this extra biblical information relating to, relating to illumination provides a context for understanding the Old Testament. Again, the Bible is not a complete record of man's history, even though it begins with creation. It only comes down to the life of Jesus and the early church. And the Bible deals with the history of God's working among the Jewish people and the doctrine of salvation through his son. However, there are many other historical events taking place at the same time outside of what is recorded in God's word. Archaeology helps to supplement understanding the entire historical situation surrounding the Bible. You might say it fills in the blanks. For example, the Old Testament speaks of a northern Israel king named Omri, and that's in 1 Kings 16 and other references. King Omri was the father of the wicked king Ahab, and Ahab's wife was Jezebel. Omri is only mentioned in about 16 verses in the Old Testament. However, he was such a powerful king that in monuments that mention him, there have been found inscriptions where at that time, northern Israel was called the House of Omri. Because a few verses speak of Omri, his importance would have not been known unless supplemented outside of the Bible by archaeology. When the Moabite stone, is just what you see there, uh, when it was found, it provided the answer to a question that had gone unanswered for centuries. The Bible states that David conquered Moab and that Solomon held Moab and that Moab broke free at the outset of the divided kingdom. But in the next biblical reference to Moab in 2 Kings 3 and 4, King Ahab is receiving tribute from King Mesha of Moab. And as 2 Kings 3 and 4, now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder and used to pay the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. Nowhere does the Bible state how or when Moab was reclaimed by Israel, but the Moabite stone provides that information telling of King Omri's conquest from the Moabite perspective. The Bible does not speak of this accomplishment, but archaeology reveals that King Omri was a more important figure than would have been known. So this, again, was some information that we may never have known about. And also, archaeology confirms the historical references made in the Bible. Many scholars used to question the existence of a Roman governor named Pontius Pilate, the procurator who ordered Jesus' crucifixion. But in June of 1961, Italian archaeologists were excavating an ancient Roman, Roman amphitheater near Caesarea and uncovered a limestone block. 
And on the face of the in is an inscription, which is a part of a large dedication to Tiberius Caesar, and clearly says, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. This is the only known occurrence of the name Pontius Pilate in any ancient inscription. Now, uh, here's another interesting fact. About a century ago, a British archaeologist, William Ramsey, focused on the Book of Acts in an attempt to show it was historically inaccurate. And we can see how Yahweh works in this. His quest did not turn out as he expected. After decades of research in what today is Israel and Turkey, he carefully retraced the steps of the apostles as described in the book of Acts and shocked the intellectual world when he announced he had converted to Christianity. His confessed change of mind was in great part to his surprise of the accuracy he found in Luke's narrative in Acts. After decades of examining the historical and geographical details mentioned in Acts, Ramsey concluded, and I quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, he is possessed of the true historic sense. In short, this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians." End quote. So ultimately, Ramsey was knighted for his contributions to the study of archaeology and geography. And we sometimes hear of other cases like this where people go out to prove other people wrong, even looking at Saul, who became Paul, they just turn around. Another value of archaeology is in the translation of the biblical text. This is especially true for the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, and Hebrew being a Semitic or Northwest Semitic language. Semitic meaning a descendant of Shem. Because there are other Semitic languages similar to Hebrew, Translation is helped every time ancient tablets are found and translated, just like the ones we've been looking at. How this helps is in clarification of rare biblical words, words that are sometimes used only once or twice in the biblical text. When these same rare words are found in a similar Semitic language, there is better understanding of how the word should be translated. There are also cognates, or words that are very similar. Now, archaeology has corrected many of the cynical ideas, false notions, and incorrect claims of biblical critics. critics. For example, it used to be claimed that the biblical references to Abraham could not be possibly historical because camels are mentioned when Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for Isaac. Camels. When they returned, the Bible says that Rebekah was on a camel. Some biblical crit critics said that this was not possible because camels had not yet been domesticated. Therefore, Abraham is not a historical character. Archaeology, however, eventually uncovered inscriptions that showed even earlier than Abraham that camels were clearly domesticated animals. In some of the research, I found that many people believe that it was um, mules or donkeys that were used, but camels were used in specific pockets before this time, but not, in pe not many people knew about it. And they were domesticated, but it was in like Ur or different places where their people were wealthy and they had camels, but it wasn't until later on that they were widely used because the, the mules and the donkeys were more pack animals. They could carry heavy loads. Sometimes a location is excavated based on evidence that indicate archaeological artifacts or monuments that could be present. And it's amazing how some cities are found just by someone finding a mound or something and kind of digging into it. And then once they look further, they find a whole city. So they are uh, discovered by conducting ground or aerial surveys. And this is also interesting, that aerial surveys are successful because moisture has a tendency to collect around stone structures such as walls and buildings. When these structures are underground, the moisture causes the ground to appear darker in color. So another possibility is to randomly, as I said, cut a hole or trench in a mound of earth where there may be a particular city or from stories that are told or from things that are passed on 
it's possible that there could be something there and people act on it. And if evidence is found with everybody's permission, an excavation can begin. And then sometimes there are chance discoveries, the most famous occurring in 1947. When a shepherd boy in the hills about 10 miles south of Jericho, just west of the Dead Sea, was tending his sheep. And one of the sheep was climbing up in the hills, so he threw a rock to scare it down. And the rock ended up going into a cave, and he heard a smash that sounded like the breaking of glass. He went up to investigate and found a broken jar that contained a scroll. And the cave also contained many other jars. The boy took a piece of the scroll to antiquities dealers in Bethlehem and Jerusalem, hoping to sell them. The antiquities dealers were astonished. The pieces of scroll were the oldest pieces of manuscript they had ever seen in their lives. You just imagine how exciting this is. Today, these manuscripts are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they contain biblical and extra-biblical literature. And every book of the Old Testament has been found, with the exception of one, the book of Esther. There are 11 different caves that have been discovered. And I, from what I understand, you can actually view these scrolls online. Just another historical fact. Archaeology as a science did not really begin until the, after the 1850s. Many discoveries made around the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s of the 1800s were nothing more than treasure hunts. As we said before, people were just going in and taking whatever they wanted, digging into things and finding things, and bringing them back to the museum, but nothing was done on a scientific basis. The father of modern archaeology was Sir William Flinders Petrie. Along with the scientific approach he took in arch with archaeology, he identified two very important concepts. And when you hear about this, you think, well, that's, you know, common sense. But at that time, people didn't really understand this. One of them is stratigraphy. It's the study of rock strata, a bed or a layer of sedimentary rock having approximately the same composition throughout. Strata are levels or layers of ground. And what Sir Petri found in Palestine and Mesopotamia, but not in Egypt, was that cities were found in piles, one heaped on top of another, with each layer representing a certain time of occupation. Now, at that time, you figure these are over thousands of years. Things are building up. It's not like here, where they tore down a gas station and rebuilt another one using the same level. These are things built on top of things over a period of time. Sites sometimes have as many as 25 or more layers of occupation because people would occupy the same site, although at different times over a period of two to 3,000 years. This might seem like common sense today, but what he discovered was that the older civilizations would be on the bottom layers and the more recent would be on the top. Again, you think it's common sense. Another important thing in, is pottery. And it also, just seeing the stones and everything that we see, or things that were on clay, they last a very long time. He discovered the importance that pottery contributes to the science of archaeology. Today, many archaeologists specialize in nothing more than pottery. And what he found was that because of the abundance of pottery in virtually all layers and levels of any archaeological dig, that it could be used to date finds. Unlike other materials, pottery does not disintegrate. Again, like with the tablets, it is made of clay and stays somewhat intact for thousands of years. Pottery can be used to date a site because over time it changes in design, shape, and style. And many of us might remember, much like the automobiles do for us today, over a given era since the invention of the automobile, we can place an automobile in specific time frame based on the shape and style of the car. For example, the wings found on automobiles, or the fins, definitely place it within a time period of the mid-50s or early 60s. This is the same with pottery. At one period of time, the handle will look a certain way. Different materials, different ways of manufacture, different glaze, different design, thus a certain time period. 
So pottery found within a particular level will provide information on what the people were that may have lived in that area and the date of occupation. Now another thing we're going to look at This is Samson and the Temple of Dagon. In Judges 16, only limited excavation has been undertaken at Gaza, so we have little idea of what the city of Samson's day was like. However, grinding houses in Judges 16 and a temple, also in Judges 16, similar to those referred to, have been unearthed at other sites. Grinding houses known both from ancient texts and excavated examples were places where prisoners would grind grain for their masters. The tools were simple, hand grinding stones, a low shaped upper stone and a large slightly concave lower stone called a saddle quern. Samson spent his days kneeling in front of a quern, pushing an upper stone back and forth, grinding grain into meal. So Samson's greatest feat was the destruction of the Temple of Dagon. And we see this diagram here, or uh, artist's rendition. The only definite Philistine temples found to date are those at Tel Kassil, on the outskirts of modern Tel Aviv. Three temples, each larger than the previous, were built on the same spot over a period of 150 years. The latest from the 11th century BC, approximately the time of Samson, measured 26 feet by 48 feet. And the two pillars supported the roof, just as in the Temple of Dagon described in Judges 16. They were made of cedar wood, approximately one foot in diameter, and rested on stone bases set in the floor. So it would have been possible to dislodge the central pillar in the Tel Kassil Temple, since it was held in place on the stone base only by the weight of the roof. And you can see in the drawing how it, just, it looks very simple. And a large man with his arms extended could have spanned the seven-foot distance, because this is six feet, where it was, uh, between the two pillars. Also, it is conceivable that the pillars of Dagon's temple were closer together than those of the Tel Kassil temple. So it would have been, having the amount of strength that he had, it would have been an easy thing to do. The collapse of one empire in the beginning of another is not unusually an overnight event, but scripture tells us that this was the case in 539 BC. When the city and the empire of Babylon were taken by Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now this is a picture of, current picture of what Babylon was. For over 200 years, the Persians were in control of the province of Judah or Yehud. And this is when the children of Israel came to be known as Jews. Nebuchadnezzar the Chaldean, who ruled Babylon, took Jerusalem in 586 BC. And Jeremiah chapter 52 tells us of the waves of invasion and captivity during his reign. But he came to take captives even before he became king. And Daniel appears to have been taken with the other royal captives as hostages in that year that Nebuchadnezzar came to the throne. While Ezekiel was taken with King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother several years early, or later, those who went to captivity, Jeremiah, Jeremiah called the very good figs, when those who remained were referred to as the evil, very evil. The captives prospered in Babylon while their country lay in ruins. Jeremiah had prophesied of a 70-year period of captivity, which Daniel had come to understand. But there was another prophecy of the individual who was to be responsible for the dramatic end of captivity for the Jews. In Isaiah 44, 28 to 45 and 3, he wrote, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates. And the gates shall not be shut, and I will go before thee and make the crooked place straight. 
I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Cyrus is referred to as a type of the Messiah who would call for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And Babylon was taken with little violence as he seems to have been welcomed into the city. Nabonidus, the king and the father of Belshazzar, who had been reigning over Babylon, was not in favor with the priest of the gods of the city, and Cyrus was welcomed when he promised to honor them. In dedicating a new temple soon after his accession, Cyrus deposited a cylinder with his account of the taking of the city. Along with his charter of rights, Cyrus's policies toward subjugated nations were certainly different from those of the Assyrians and Babylonians, who had treated subject people harshly. He permitted the resettling of those who had been previously deported and sponsored the reconstruction of religious buildings. And he fostered an image of a liberator and worked to gain the goodwill of the people. Later in Isaiah chapter 61, we read of the role of the Messiah to which Cyrus was linked. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And then we have um, an archaeologist, Edward Robinson, and he discovered Hezekiah's tunnel in April of 1838. as the Pool of Siloam. But it was in 1880 when a discovery was made which confirmed the work of Scripture, or the word of Scripture, and Robinson's conjecture. He knew that he was going to find this, uh, the passage. In June of that year, some schoolboys playing in the pool of Siloam accidentally discovered some writing on the wall of the tunnel, 30 feet from the entrance. Finally, the tail of the tunnel was revealed. So up until that time, nobody knew about the rest of it or how it got there. And uh, this, the writing of this, uh, somebody had come along and taken it out. So uh, if finally was recovered, and it's now in a museum. But the writing was the tunneling, and this was how the tunneling was completed. As the stone cutters wielded their picks, each crew toward, toward the other, and while there were still three cubits to go, the voices of the men calling each other could be heard, since there was an increase in sound on the right and left. The day the breach was made, the stone cutters hacked toward each other, pick against pick. And the water flowed from the source to the pool, 1,200 cubits, even though the height of the rock above the heads of the stone cutters was 100 cubits. And that's from the Bible dictionary. And that was the Siloam inscription. Okay, now this is a diagram of Hezekiah's tunnel. So you can imagine the amount of work that went into this, and you can see how it's snaking through the whole part where it comes to um, Gaihan Spring is at the beginning on the far right. Yep. And uh, and the Gaihan Pool and the Pool Towers are on the inside. And then you go to the Pool of Siloam, which is over on this side. And then it comes to the runoff pool. And as the dictionary adds about this, that the construction of the tunnel from both ends at once, multiplying the difficulties in engineering, as we can see from this drawing, upon Hezekiah by the threat of Sennacherib. And as um, Dr. Robinson was led to believe in conversation with the locals, again, finding out stories from the local people or um, for history, that the source of the waters for the Pool of Siloam was beneath the Temple Mount. In his book, Underground Jerusalem, Charles Wilson explored many of the subterranean passages beneath the mount 
and map the examples or the complex of underground water storage systems, but did not locate the source of the waters. And Ezekiel tells us that in the future, millennial age, in Ezekiel 47 and 1, afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house, or eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. These waters will heal the waters of the Dead Sea, and trees will grow by the river, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which bring, being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. This is Ezekiel 47. Verse 8. Verse 9. It shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth, Whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on the side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. This is a wonderful late thing to look forward to. It should be bring forth new fruit according to its months, because the waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. One other place we're going to look at is the archaeological work underway in Jerusalem, uh, finding the royal house of David. Now, it existed in a period of history that remained hidden from the eyes of the world for many centuries. Outside of the Bible, little was heard of it, still less seen for most of the 2,000 years. But Acts 2 and 29 tells us that the sepulcher, or tomb, or monument of David was identifiable in apostolic times. But evidence of the royal dynasty was virtually non-existent, again, with Edward Robinson discovering Hezekiah's tunnel in 1838. Many believe that King David was a myth. And we've heard that from a lot of people, that many of the things in the Bible are just stories or fables. Especially the academic world of the 19th and 20th centuries. Even when the House of David inscription was found at Tel Dan in 1993 and 94, many scholars remain skeptical of his actual existence. Today, however, the minimalists who deny the biblical record are flying in the face of recently discovered facts that relate directly to the royal house itself. Ancient historical records have often proved reliable guidance to archaeologists as they have searched for the physical remains of the past. Certainly, the Bible has proved to be the archaeologist's guide book at various excavation sites in modern Israel. And this is the case when we consider the area known as the City of David just south of the Temple, south of the Temple Mount towards the modern Arab area of Silwan. Okay, and um, in the 1920s, an archaeologist by the name of McAllister found a stone step structure which he identified as a Jebusite fortress. Now, looking at the picture, if you look in the center, and you can see the way it's, it's sort of like a pile of rocks there. It looks like steps. And then when Kathleen Kenyon excavated the area in 1961 through 67, she arrived at a similar conclusion. Uh, they thought that the stone, or the step stone structure was the last remains of the Jebusite fortress, a support structure. In 2 Samuel 5, 6 through 10, we have the biblical account of the history surrounding this fortress. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, and the same is the city of David. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo or Milo and inward. And he went on and grew great and the Lord God of hosts was with him. When we read in verse 11 that the Phoenician king Hiram of Tyre built a palace for David, 
And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David and house. And it's in this area. If the stone step structure was part of the original fortress, the Milo Citadel or rampart where was the palace and could archaeologists find any remain of it. Close to 15 years ago, an archaeologist named Elat Mazar, granddaughter of Benjamin Mazar, who excavated in the southern end of the Temple Mount, published an article in which she conjectured that if the excavations were carried out just north of the step structure, the Palace of David would be found there. It seems that her main reason for this was the passage of 2 Samuel 5 and 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, and the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. Now if David went down to the stronghold or fortress, where did he go down from? She assumed that going down was from north to south. And in a newspaper article that had the headline, Dr. Elat Mazar, the Bible as blueprint. And they had this uh, comment. She is both revered and reviled by some of her colleagues for being a biblical archaeologist. She says that the Bible is unquestionably the most important historical source for her work, since it contains a genuine historical account of the past. And as she says, I work with the Bible in one hand and the tools of excavation in the other. The Bible is the most important historical evidence or source. So in her own way, she is issuing a challenge to the modern unbelieving world, and that can make life difficult. Her ideas were not received with too much enthusiasm, and funds are not usually provided for her kind of speculation. But she was persistent. She received the necessary permission and funding so that she could proceed with the project in 2005. It was discovered that the stepped structure was connected to a large stone wall, part of a large building which she says must be dated to the 10th century BC on the basis of the ceramics found, again, looking at the pottery and things like that. The parts of the building that have now been uncovered, she concludes, are the remains of the Palace of David. I didn't think that King David's palace was so huge. I had in mind something much smaller, but it's not. It's very large. The external eastern wall, she says, is about six meters over 19 and a half feet. But the other evidence which confirms the biblical account is that we are seeing here building that is typical of Phoenician construction. She said that these remains have survived because the building was so well constructed. Very, very sophisticated construction methods. Although it was 3,000 years ago, it is possible to reveal the foundations of this massive building. No doubt, she says, just as the Bible says, and we can see it in the field, that only the Phoenicians knew at that time how to build such sophisticated construction. And the Bible says that these are the Phoenicians, Hiram, king of Tyre. He did it, and we know Phoenician construction. It seems to be that the entire building covered about an acre. And in addition to this, there have been other artifacts which are of Phoenician origin, such as ivory. And uh, in the same area, Kathleen Kenyon found architectural ornaments that were typical of royal palaces in Phoenician design. So far, only a portion of this palace building has been uncovered. Work continues, but is subject to both political and funding challenges. Who knows what yet may be discovered here? The royal buildings were in use over a period of some 500 years. From the time of King David himself right down to the time of Zedekiah and the Babylonian destruction, 586 BC. In 2 Kings 25 and 9, we read of the tragic end of the kingdom at the hands of Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. And every great man's house burnt he with fire. They break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt it, all the palaces thereof, with fire. And that's 2 Chronicles 36 and 19. So the royal house of David was overturned and literally lay in ruins. But to Zedekiah, the last reigning monarch, it was said through the prophet Ezekiel in 21, verses 25 through 27. 
And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall come no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. The kingdom was to be overturned until a future time, a time when the rightful heir to be the Davidic throne should appear. This is the heir to the throne promised by God to David, as recorded in 2 Samuel 7. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Thanks to the finding of the archaeologists, many of the areas in Scripture can better be understood now more than ever before. And again, we only covered a portion of what's available. So no book in the whole history of mankind has had such a revolutionary influence, has so decisively affected the development of the Western world, or had such a worldwide effect as the book of books, the Bible. In gathering together materials for this lecture, it seemed appropriate that this should be shared with those who read the Bibles and those who don't. The exciting discoveries, which have been the result of archaeology, showing that the well-documented evidence proves that the Bible is right, after all.